the mission of the course is to predict the parameter of the population based on a statistic of the sample. And it is a witchery because we want to predict the parameter of the population which we don't have access to. We don't have access to the population. We don't have access to all of the target market. We don't have access to all of the population of Canada. We don't have access to uh, all of the products that are produced in a factory. We want to predict the average of the products, average of income of Canadian, average money the customers are willing to spend on a product based on a tiny sample and predicting a huge population parameter not accessible to us based on a tiny sample is a witchery. It's an amazing thing that I'm going to teach you. We want to predict the parameter of the population based on a statistic of the sample. Yeah. What is the, what is the exciting about this? We don't have access to the population. So we're but just... we want to predict things about it. Yes, yeah. very good. We are going to talk about types of statistics. Uh, there are two types of statistics. One is descriptive statistics, the other is inferential statistics. Descriptive statistic is describing what we know. Now, what do we know about the world? Tell me. What is that thing that we know about the world? You know, samples. Very good. James, you are doing very well. Yes. Yeah, we, the only thing that we know is the sample. So when we, uh, you know, if we want to understand our sample better, you know, we want to know what is the mean of the sample, median of the sample, how the numbers in the sample are distributed and so forth. That is called descriptive statistics, describing what we know. And of course, that's the initial step. If we don't understand our sample, we won't be able to predict anything about the population. So at first, we will discuss descriptive statistics, thinking about the uh, how can we find the statistic of this sample? How can we find the statistic of that sample? Uh, what are the things that we can use to describe what we have in our hands and so forth? And then the next step is inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is that part that takes us from the sample to the population. So there is a part in which we go from our sample to our population, like this way, to predict the parameter of the population. That is called inferential statistics. Actually, the goal of the course is something inferential. We want to predict the parameter of the population based on a statistic of the sample. That, that is a kind of inference. So although the inferential statistic is the goal of the course to be able to infer things about the huge universe, um, but uh, we have to be able to do descriptive statistics and use that descriptive statistics to go toward the, the inferential step. Okay. Just imagine that we have this sample. And in this sample, we have, uh, you know, let's say it's a sample of people. And in that sample, we have a number of people, N people. Okay. There are two possible questions that I can ask from the people who are in my sample. Question one is this. Some questions are really boring, okay? For example, if I'm interested in what is the university that these people in my sample are uh, getting this course? Let's say you are my sample and I ask you this question. What is the university in which you get this course, okay? Uh, let's go there, Jacob. What is the university that you got this course in? Capilano University. Very good. Ahmad, what is the university that you got this course in? Capilano University. And if I continue asking this question, I will get all the same answer because I am asking a question from each one of these people, which is a constant. A constant 
is an attribute of my sample, one of your attributes, like the university that you are taking this course, uh, but that attribute is a constant. Like if I ask you, are you human or not? All of you say, yes, 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 yes. I'm collecting a constant. So uh, we have constants, and then we have measurements about our sample that varies. <coughs> For example, what would be another question that I might ask you? Um, let's say I'm interested in uh, how many children you have. So I go to each person and say, uh, the, to each of the members of the sample, how many children you have? Yep. How many children you have? I'm not married. So zero. Zero. Yeah, yeah but it is possible that one of you has one child. And so uh, the first person says, I have zero children. The next person I say, says I have two children. Next person says I have one child. So as I go to the members of the sample, each person may tell me, may tell me that they have a different number of children. So number of children, if I ask you how many children are in your family, it will definitely change. Like how many children were, or how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, this will, you know, uh, each person will tell me a different number. One, zero, two, and so forth. So this one, the answer to the question varies. What would be a good name for something that we want to measure and it varies? Uh, it is not constant. Variable. Exactly. And this is what we do. We call it a variable. So we have constants and we have variables. Variables are exciting. Constants are boring. Constants are always the same. But variables are hard to predict. Like if something varies in my sample, how can I predict something that is varying in the population? It's very hard. And it's more, more exciting. So we want to predict what is the situation of a variable in the population. Therefore, we have to understand what is the situation of that variable in our sample. A variable can be of many different kinds. For example, um, if I ask you, do you like apple? Yes. This like, um, yes, you can say like, uh, I like it, but you know, uh, if I ask you how much do you like it, um, this, the amount of liking cannot be measured, okay? It's very important to understand. There are some variables that we cannot really measure them. There is no unit of measurement for them. Uh, liking, loving, you know, uh, these kind of things, they are qualitative. But we may be interested in them. I, I can ask, you know, you 35 of you, do you like a Spider-Man movie or not? And, 10 of you say I like it, 10 of you say I don't like it, number of you will say I'm neutral. So liking, although it's qualitative, you may be interested in that variable. Uh, is liking a variable? Is liking a variable? Yes. Why? Um, I don't know, actually. Is liking a variable? Yes, because it's not constant. It's yeah, changing. Because, yeah, because as I go from one member of the sample to the next member of the sample, it can change. One person can say, I like. Another person can say, I don't like. The third person can say, I'm neutral. So it's a variable. But it's a qualitative variable. Then... Um, you also have variables that are quantitative. For example, um, if I ask you how many cars your family have, okay? So that is a quantitative question. To answer me, you have to go to your backyard and count the number of cars that your family has, okay? And if the answer to a quantitative question is 
the result of counting, it's called discrete. So when I asked you how many children do you have, was that quantitative or qualitative? That was quantitative. And what kind of quantitative? It is discrete or continuous? Discrete. Because it is very good. Because it's the result of counting. Therefore, it is discrete. Discrete means that you cannot say we have 2.5 cars. I have 2.7 cars. This is impossible. You either have two cars or three cars. Therefore, it is discrete. Now, also, we have variables that are continuous. Uh, for example, if I ask you, um, what is your height? Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you. You don't have to disclose your private you know, information. You can fake it. But how much is your height? 170. Very good. So your height, you're claiming is 170 centimeters. But I claim that you're lying. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because between 169 centimeters and 171 centimeters, how many heights exist? Answer me, Emily. How many heights are possible between 169 centimeters and 171 centimeters? One. So you cannot, your height cannot be 169.1? Infinite? Is it, is it 10? No. 30. Um, your height can be 169.1, 169.11, 169.12, 169.13. Very yes. good. Yeah. The number of heights that exists between 169 and 171 is infinite number of possibilities. Infinity is like a sleeping eight, resting eight. So the number of possible heights between 169 and 171 is infinite. And your height is possible that it is between 169 and 171, but the chance that your height is exactly 170 is very zero. If your height is probably 170.0000000121. The chance that your height is exactly 170 is very unlikely. Do you know why? You know why? Because there are infinite number of possibilities there for your height. Your height is not result of counting the number of centimeters. To measure your height, we compare your height with a standard meter. Also, if I wanted to find out how much is your weight would be the same thing. There is a standard kilogram in a museum somewhere. And then we have to compare your weight with that weight of a kilogram that is determined by scientists somewhere. And then based on that comparison, I have to give a weight to you. It's not the result of counting. So when a variable can vary and during its variation, it can have infinite number of possibilities, it is called a continuous variable. Good. So Joshua. Can you say that again? When a variable, while varying, can have infinite number of values, we call it continuous variable. If uh, the value of a variable is the result of counting, we call it a discrete variable. Counting doesn't have infinite possibilities. Like how many pens are on my desk? One, two, three, four, five. I cannot have 3.6 pens on my desk. Either I have three or four. But if between three and four centimeters, there are infinite number of lengths, then 
that is then the length is a continuous variable. So when the number of values that a variable can assume while it is changing is infinite, then it is continuous. Now, the number of children. How many children are between six children and seven children? How many children are between these two? One. No, there is nothing. Between six children and seven children, there is nothing. There is no 6.1. There is no 6.2. So how many children can exist in my home between two children that I have and three children? And none. none. There is no other possibility. Either I have two children or three. Therefore, it is discrete. When it is the result of counting, it is discrete. When it is the result of comparison, it is continuous. Now, these, the variables are of our interest because uh, constants are boring. Now, variables have different levels of information in them. The first level of data uh, is called nominal. The nominal level data has the least amount of um, information in it. It doesn't have a lot of things to tell us. Um, and the other name for it is categorical. Categorical level data uh, is the result of counting. And uh, when we have categorical level data, the only thing that we can do with it is that we can put it into categories. And when we have a data that is categorical, actually we are happy because there is possible that we have data that is not categorical. And you know, it goes beyond the domain of science even. So when it is categorical, for example, I may be interested in what proportion of the students in my class wear hat and what proportion don't wear hat. So uh, can I put uh, my students into two categories, wearing hat and not wearing hat? Yeah, yeah. so I will be happy. Uh, I will tell you why I'm happy because uh, I can do it. You know, hat or no hat, this is the question. And I can put people into categories. Let's say five people are wearing hat and uh, 20 people are not wearing hat. Okay. I can put my uh, research question in uh, the result of my measurement of, by looking at my subjects. I can put them into categories. Notice that it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you can put the variables into categories. Sometimes you can't. So, for example, if I ask you, are you a, um, a male or female or other? So I can come to each one of you, and based on your expression, I want to put you into categories. Can I put you into categories, uh, male, female, and other? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, if I wanted to do it myself, I wouldn't be able to, but based on your expression, I can, right? Based, I can say people in this sample, based on their expression, they go to these categories. So gender is a categorical data or a nominal level data. Now, uh, just look at this question. Uh, can I put you into different categories based on whether God loves you or not? No. no. Just think about no. this. Whether God loves you or not. Whether there is an angel on your shoulders or not. Okay? So these kind of questions, we cannot even put people into categories for them. These go to the domain of theology and philosophy and other fields of human knowledge. Okay? There are some fields in which we can, you know, ask our sample questions and put them into categories. Sometimes it is not possible. So when it is possible, we are happy. At least we can put our subjects of study into categories. And we can do, if, if we can do that, we are very happy, we feel good, 
and we say we have nominal level data. But there are some data that are richer than nominal level data. They are called ordinal data. This level, sometimes it's called nominal level. Uh, the other name is called scale in other books. Uh, ordinal scale or ordinal level data is richer than uh, nominal level data. For example, I show you a Spider-Man movie and then I ask you um, what was your opinion and I want to put you into different categories based on your expression about the Spider-Man movie. So some of you say that uh, I like the movie. Some of you say that I dislike very much. Some of you say I like very much. Uh, some of you say I dislike the movie. And some of you say I'm neutral. So I repeat that. 10 people said I like, 12 people said dislike very much, 11 people like very much, um, uh, 12 people dislike, and five people said they are neutral. Now, can I, can I put my students into categories based on this measurement? Based on their expression of liking yeah. and disliking? Yes. Can I? Yeah, if I can, then this data, I say it is nominal or categorical because I can put my data into categories. Now, um, when you look at the way that I presented my measurements, is there anything that hurts your feeling, makes you unhappy the way that I presented my result? Focus on my result and tell me if there is anything that irritates your feelings. It's not in order. It's not in order. Yeah. So notice that I didn't teach you anything about this, but you automatically feel uneasy. There is something wrong, right? Okay. You know why? Because there is an inherent order in this measurement. Tell me what would be a good order. For example, is this good? Dislike very much. Dislike, neutral, like, like very much. Do you like this? Uh, do you feel good when I present my data like that? Yeah. Better. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it feels sure. good. It feels. Also, there is another way, an um, inherent order. Like very much, like, neutral, dislike, dislike very much. Uh, the second one is also reasonable. Um, uh, there is nothing that would hurt you, your feelings, uh, if I use that. But the way that I have presented right now, it irritates us. Why would somebody present the data like that? Because in this measurement of liking, disliking, there is an inherent order. When that happens we have ordinal level data. Now let's think about this. Is, is this ordinal? Hat, no hat. Is this an inherent order? Yeah. So no. look at this. I'm presenting these many people female, these many people are male, these many people are other. Uh, is there anything irritating you? Do you feel that the male should be first? Okay. Do you feel that female should be first? I can present this data in any way that I wish. Like nobody can say that male, female, other is better than female, male, other. Or even if I say other, male, female, male, or no matter how I show this data, there is no 
Nobody has said that female should be presented first and male second and other in the middle or, or whatever. There is no inherent order in the case of having had, no, not having had, being female or male. This data is simply categorical. There is no inherent order. While for liking, disliking, there is an inherent order. Um, so is uh, liking, disliking nominal? It is nominal. I can categorize them. That was the first question that I asked you. I can categorize data based on that, but plus being nominal, it is ordinal. Notice that it is always the same. If something is not nominal, we cannot order it. As we go from a lower level of data to a higher level of data, uh, the lower levels must be satisfied. Otherwise, we cannot go higher. If you cannot categorize something, how can you say that what is the order there? Just think about this. If we couldn't categorize the answers, then we, we wouldn't be able to put them in order. Okay. Now, there is another level of data that is even richer than this. Okay. Level three is even richer than ordinal. And that level is called interval. Okay. Interval level data, uh, something that is interval, as I mentioned, must be, uh, must be nominal, must be ordinal, but it has some extra information in it. Uh, so let's imagine that we are thinking about um, maximum temperature in every day. Okay? So can I put my days into categories based on how many days, let's say I say 100 days, the temperature was between zero and 10 degrees centigrade. And then we had 50 days, 150 days, that the temperature was between 10 and 20. And we had, uh, let's say, um, 50 days that the temperature was between 20 and 25. And uh, 75 days, the temperature was between 25 and 30 degrees centigrade. Can I categorize the days of the year based on their maximum temperature? Yes. Yeah. So if we can categorize, this data is, what is that called? Um, when we categorize? Nominal. So it is nominal, very good. Now, when I present this data um, to you, do you think that there is an inherent order, like this order 0, 10, 20, 25, and so forth, or I can shuffle them as I wish and you wouldn't care? Inherent. It has an inherent order. Therefore, this data is? Ordinal. Ordinal. But there is something more in this data, okay? If I ask you, how much is the difference between a day in which the temperature was 20 degrees and a day that the temperature was 10 degrees? Can you tell me how much was the difference? 50 days. Uh, between, no, no. How much is the difference between a day when the temperature is 20, 20 degrees centigrade, 20. and another day that the temperature was 10 degrees centigrade. 10 degrees How much is the difference? 10 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so so we, can, we can exactly say how much is the difference. So not only there is an inherent order, but based, uh, we know what is the difference between 20 and 10, right? Therefore, this data is called interval. The intervals are well defined. You may think that it is always like that. It is not always like that. So let's go to ordinal data. Um, 
Mil. I have a question for you. Yeah. John says I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Robert says I love you very much. Okay. Which one loves you more? Be very careful. Ladies and gentlemen, don't rush to answer because this is a life matter. It can be very dangerous if you be lousy about this. Think carefully. Which one loves you more? John or Robert? John says, I love you. Robert says, I love you very much. You see? This is tough. I told you. Is it the same? Do they love you the same amount? You can't know which one loves you more because you can't quantify what they mean with the terms they say. Yeah, who, who answered that? Jacob. Jacob, yes, very good. Yeah, like there is no unit of measurement for love. Maybe that person who says I love you very much is not ready to buy you an ice cream. <laughs> and maybe the person who says I love you is ready to die for you because love is a subjective matter. Everybody has a different understanding from love. Okay, it's a very important thing for you to pay attention to the fact that love is an ordinal thing. Okay, we don't know how much is the distance between love you very much. And now if two people are telling you, we even don't know how much they love. Now, let me ask, uh, uh, Edward says that he loves Mary and he loves Susan very much. Edward loves Mary. Edward loves Susan very much. Which one Edward loves more? You also don't know. No, no, no. This is, this, this is a different thing. Uh, now Edward is expressing his level of love. Edward is saying, I love Mary. I love Susan very much. Which one Edward loves more? Very much. Susan. But the problem is that, how much Edward loves Susan more than Mary? Don't know. We don't know. Okay. So, so if two people are talking about love, we don't know at all. If one person is talking about two different levels of love, we know that there is an order, but we don't know how much. So love, love remains an ordinal thing. But temperature is not only ordinal, but also it is interval. Because we know how much is the difference between 20 degrees and 10 degrees. Are you following me? Yes. Okay. Now there is one more higher level of data that is even richer than interval. And that level is ratio. Sometimes, not only we can categorize, uh, not only it's uh, inherent order, not only that we know the difference, but also the ratio is not subjective. I will give you an example. So uh, let's say we are interested in the heights of students. Can I put my students into different categories? Those who are between 150 to 160 centimeters, there are 10 of them, those who are from 160 to 170 centimeter, there are 15 of them. 170 to 180, there are 12 of them. And 180 to 90, there is seven of them. Can I put my students into categories based on their height? Yes. yes. So this data is um, no. Okay, I'm just showing you how you must answer in the exam. You shouldn't rush to judgment. 
you have to start from the lowest level and then you go up 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 until you cannot go further and that's your level so nominal is there an inherent order or i can shuffle these columns as i wish inherent therefore the data is or Now, do we know the distance of 100 centimeters to 170 centimeters, or it's like love? It's not like love. We do know. We do know. Therefore, it is? Interval. Interval. Now, what is, ex you know, special about this height compared to temperature is this. If the height of a table is 200 centimeters compared to another table that its height is 100 centimeters. What is the ratio? Two, mm -hmm. yeah. Two the ratio one. is two, right? Now, if I change the unit of measurement from centimeter to inches, so this 200 becomes how many inches? Um, 80 or something? 78. And how many inches? And how many inches is 100 centimeters? 39.37. And the ratio will be 2 because you are dividing the, if you are, if you are dividing 200 by A, and you are dividing 100 by A to find the inches, the result will still be two. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if I measure this ratio based on centimeters, or if I measure it based on inches, or kilometers, or whatever, the ratio would be the same. Yeah. Therefore, this data is ratio. I will tell you the reason. The reason is that if the height of a table is zero centimeters, it means that the table is underground. There is no height. Zero in case of height means there is no height. It's also like uh, money. Like uh, if, uh, if uh, James, how much money is in your pocket right now? Five bucks. Five bucks. Now, um, uh, and um, Boston, how much money is in your pocket? 20. How much money is in your pocket right now? Zero. Zero. So look at that. This is a good example. Okay. Boston, if you change the money that is in your pocket to euro, how much euros do you have? Zero. And if you change it to American dollar, how much euro, how much American dollars do you have? Still zero. Zero. So this money, amount of money in your pocket is ratio. Uh, if, if Boston had $10, Boston had twice James. And if you change it to Euro, it would be twice. If you change it to Yen, it would be twice. Because zero dollars means you don't, you don't have any dollar. Now let's go to temperature, okay? How much is the ratio of 20 degrees centigrade to 10 degrees centigrade two two now i want you to go to google and tell me 20 degrees centigrade is how many degrees fahrenheit 68 tell me exact amount because it matters 20 degrees centigrade is how many degrees fahrenheit exactly 68 yeah. Right. And 10 degrees? 24. 10 degrees is 50. 50. 50. Okay. And the ratio is? One point three six. So look. Here, the temperature ratio is not remaining the same. It depends on the unit of measurement. Like if you measure it in terms of uh, centigrade, uh, one day is twice hotter than the other day. If you measure it in Fahrenheit, it's only 30% hotter. 
So temperature is not ratio. And I will tell you why. Because zero degrees centigrade doesn't mean that we don't have any temperature. It's just Mr. Celsius decided to call this zero. Mr. Fahrenheit called the same temperature 32. That's the equilibrium of ice and water. Celsius decided that that temperature is zero. Mr. Fahrenheit decided that that temperature is 32. Mr. Kelvin calls this temperature, does anybody know? For Kelvin, 272. So every person calls that, um, you know, when you have an equilibrium of ice and water, it doesn't mean that there is no temperature. You just call it zero. While if you don't have any height, it means that you are on the ground. If you don't have any money, it means that you are poor. It doesn't matter how you measure it. Okay? That's the difference between interval and ratio. The ratio has a zero, maybe I write it for you. The ratio has two serious meanings. One is that the, the ratio is preserved. Ratio is preserved. And the other one is that zero means not existence. Nothing exists. One, two. Okay? So ratio means, has two attributes. Zero means nothing exists and the ratio is preserved. Interval, uh, an interval data is when zero is subjective. Okay. And by that, we have covered all of the four levels of data that we have. Uh, later, you will see that it is very important for us to know with what kind of data we are dealing uh, because it determines uh, what we can do with them. So now let's um, have some examples. We want to know uh, how many products people uh, uh, want to buy from us. Okay, So uh, can we put people into, so what is the level of data? We want to measure how many products um, the people will buy from us. So we go to each person in the sample and ask, will you buy 10 pencils? Will you buy, how many pencils you buy? Uh, one of them says 10, one of them says two, one of them says five. What is the level of this data? Okay, uh, so I write it down and you help me. How many products? That is the question. And we want to find out what is the level of data. The first question is that, can we categorize people based on the number of uh, products they want to buy? Yeah. How many of you say, yes, we can categorize them? Yes. One, two, yeah, yeah we can. So what is the level of this data? Nominal. We always start from the minimum and we go forward. Uh, if you put them into categories, like those who say between 0 to 10, 10 to 20, is there an inherent order? Yes, there is. Yes. Yes. So what is the level of this data? Okay. And when there is an order, if we say, the, uh, do we know what is the exact difference between a person who buys 10 products and a person who buys five products? Yes. Yeah. So this data is? Interval. Interval. And uh, is this data ratio? Like does zero means, if, if somebody buys zero product, does it mean that he will buy no product or yes. it is subjective? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, means. it means that he will not buy any product. It's not subjective. So this data is? Ratio. Ratio. In other words, if somebody buys 20 products and another person buys 10 products, no matter what is the unit of measurement, that person is buying twice the other one. Okay? So now another one. Okay, we have two products, A and B, 
And we ask our customers if they buy A or they buy B. So we go to each person and we ask them, do you buy A or B? And the person says A, another person says B. Can we, so what is the level of this data? Um, See if it's uh, nominal. Is it nominal? Can we categorize people based on if they buy product A or product B? Yes. Yes. So it is? Nominal. Nominal. What is the next step? See if it's ordinal, uh, ordinal data or not. Yeah. So um, is this ordinal? Um, like uh, if I present my data like this, 10 people by A and 20 people by B. Um, sorry, 20 people by B. So yes. can I put this in any order that I wish or I have to put A first or B first? You can put it in any order. Any order. So th there is no inherent order. So what is the level of this data? No, no. Yeah, we have stopped there. We tried to go to the higher level to see if there is more information there, but there wasn't. So the level of this data is? Okay, I hope that you understood what is going on here, both from the point of view of the knowledge and point of the view of the method. The method is that you start from the lowest level of richness and you go higher and you stop where you cannot go further. Good? Yep. Give me a go ahead signal. Oh, yes, I got a lot of them. Thank you. Okay, and by that we have finished this chapter. I just want uh, to draw your attention that you have to look at end of chapter questions, especially, like I tell you what is the exam question. Uh, in the exam, you will have questions that I will give you a data set, actual numbers um, that is measured, and I will ask you what is the level of data. So please work on those questions that ask you, is this continuous, discrete, and those. And also, especially the questions that ask you, uh, what is the level? Is this nominal, ordinal? And there are some questions in the book that are really thought-provoking. So work on them and ask those questions in our next class. All righty. Thank Good? you. Good? Yeah. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. See you on Thank Thursday. You. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.